All right, guys, welcome to another video by 2IIM. In this video, we'll be looking at how not to do DILR. All right, so we'll be going through some of the most common mistakes aspirants make when they are solving DILR or when they are practicing DILR. And we'll look at maybe things, maybe ways how to fix these mistakes, how to avoid them so that you don't end up following in these traps during the actual exam. All right, so very quickly, we'll start with a meme as is custom with all videos to IM, we either start with a meme or we start with something funny, more often than not. So the dilemma is attempt a tough DILR set and waste 15 minutes or skip it and regret later. I think this was a dilemma faced by a lot of people back in uh, DILR CAT 23 and even for CAT 24. Since they changed the pattern a bit, people really got thrown off their game. So this happened. Uh, the aim of today's video is to not end up like this guy. All right, we look at him, man, he looks, oh God, I, I feel mercy for him. All right, so list of things not to do. Step number one, not reading the set carefully. People do this a lot. You rush through the instructions, you rush through what's given, especially during CAT, you are in a heightened state of anxiety, you're kind of panicking. Uh, you just finished your VARC section, you're moving into the DILR section, you're anxious and you don't read the question properly. Okay, and then what happens is you misinterpret the data given. You have assumptions in the back of your head. This set might seem or feel familiar to something you had solved before. And then you think, oh, well, this is oddly sim similar to what I did three days back. So the things that they're asking for, for are also going to be similar. And that's where you make the mistake. You don't read carefully. You're not looking for what they're asking for. You end up doing a bunch of calculations and then you realize, oh, well, this is not even what they were asking for. Okay. Or you could make mistakes like not realizing that the values is in thousands and things like that. Okay. So the fix is read the entire set. Take one to two minutes. It's not going to kill you, but read the entire set carefully patiently and then move forward and then decide hey should I do this if you're gonna do this well then move forward slowly cautiously all right but you have to read the whole set properly the other mistake that people do a lot is spending too much time on one set or not picking the right set now this is similar to the problem we saw just before that people are not reading the set properly the, the, the um, opposite end, right, the, 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 the end, the thing on the other end of the spectrum is this, that you're, you're, you're spending too much time on one set. Now, this happens because maybe there's a bit of ego involved. You realize, hey, this is not so easy uh, or it's not as easy as I thought it was, but I'll, I'll, I'll stick with it. I'll get it done. And that's a good thing. But sometimes you really have to learn to let go. All right. So... Sometimes you get stuck on a really complex set. It has a puzzle. Maybe it has six to seven variables. The clues are not straightforward. You're not able to eliminate much from the clues either. You end up wasting 20, 25 minutes on this set. Then panic kicks in. All right. So the fix is to quickly scan all the sets right at the start. So you, 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 you're faced with your questions. Run through them one, one by one quickly. Go through all types of sets that are there in the section and then decide, hey, this one seems familiar. I'm comfortable with this kind of problem. Let me attack that first. Okay. And set a time limit. If you are stuck on something, if you have wasted five to seven minutes, you're going nowhere, you're stuck in this, you really don't know what to do, ditch it, leave it, move on. Now, making silly errors, okay, like say reading uh, 120 as 12 or reading 150 as maybe as 50, these kind of er errors can kill you. And the problem is uh, sometimes in these day other questions, you work, you build on what you've already calculated. So imagine making a building, you're, you're, you're raising this structure into the sky, this huge skyscraper. But your foundation is, you know, bad. Your foundation is not properly formed. The building is going to fall pretty soon. That's what happens with your DILR questions. Okay, so this happens. 
for example, difference between highest and maximum, there's a difference, okay? But if you're not careful enough, you might read the two and think they're the same. Uh, maximum can occur multiple times, right? If say there are five guys who have scored, say two of them have scored 90 and nobody else has scored more than 90, those two can have the maximum mark of 90, right? But can we say, so, so, so we can't say they're just one maximum, right? There are two guys who have 90. Now you need to be clever enough or more importantly aware enough to know this, right? So there's a difference between highest and maximum. Highest is exclusive. When I say, hey, that person scored the highest, that means that person is unparalleled. Whatever they scored is the highest, there cannot be any other, right? Things like these, okay? So how to fix this? Double check the numbers before calculating. Be slow with your calculations, it's fine because you're gonna be building upon these, right? So you, do, you don't wanna make a mistake at this stage, all right? Uh, check for all likely possibilities, all likely scenarios. Don't be hasty to eliminate them, which should bring us to our one of our next points. We will touch upon that hastiness in a bit, okay? Now, ignoring questions. Ignoring questions, not literally, but you're ignoring what the question asked of you. So you could be given a huge table and you start calculating averages for each and every column, right? But that's not necessary. Maybe, maybe the question is not going to ask you for averages. Maybe it's going to ask you something else. Maybe the question is not going to ask you for all the five columns. Maybe the question is only going to ask you for column A or column C. Then it's pointless to not look at the question, not understand what is being asked and start calculating and start filling up the entire table just because that's something you've always done, all right? So DLI question, DILR questions often need specific answers, okay? Seldom do they involve you to go through all the data or to fill in all the blanks. That seldom happens, okay? So how to fix this? Read the questions first, understand the set, focus only on what's needed, okay? If the question's asking for highest value, go for highest values, focus, is, focus on that. Don't, don't, don't obsess about averages, don't start calculating averages, okay? Now, I was talking about hasty elimination. This happens when you're operating from a mindset of weakness. You, you are scared of DILR, you're not confident. You, your mind subconsciously is begging you to look for the easy way out. And the easy way out is to eliminate options, eliminate scenarios, which may later turn out to be, you know, legit. So because you were scared, because you were afraid, because you wanted to reduce the calculations or get done with the problem quickly, you end up eliminating an option or a scenario without thoroughly analyzing why you just did that, okay? So the fix is to slow down, consider all possibilities, eliminate only after you are 120% sure that listen, this possibility, this scenario can never happen. Only then eliminate it. If there's even a percent of doubt that, hey, this may be, may be possible, I'm not able to convince myself that this cannot happen, don't eliminate that scenario. Don't eliminate that possibility, okay? Up next, you're not practicing enough variety, you're not practicing different types of questions. Say you're somebody who's good at games and tournaments, and all you end up practicing, or the majority of what you end up practicing are games and tournaments, Suppose the CAT question paper, the, the, the DILR section does not have games and tournaments, then what? It has something which you are weak at. So, suppose say you're bad at DI, you're bad at bar charts. Suppose there's a question on bar charts, say you're bad at pie charts, there's a question on pie charts. So you're bad at set theory or Venn diagrams and then there's a question on Venn diagrams. What are you gonna do then? So you can make sure that you're not sucker punched in the actual exam by practicing a great variety of questions, all right? So lack of exposure kills adaptability. Remember this, internalize this. If you're weak at something in DILR, go and practice that first, okay? Make sure you don't have an Achilles heel, all right? So practice high number of sets weekly. Maybe you could set yourself a target, say maybe 10 sets a week, 15 sets a week, two sets a day, two sets each day from CAT PYQs or whatever. Doing this will help you build confidence, okay? You'll realize, hey, I wasn't so bad as I initially thought I was, okay? 
panicking and the time pressure this happens a lot this happens to this can happen to anybody more often than not it happens to everybody you're solving a set you've given the 10 15 minutes you're halfway there but then suddenly you hit a dead end and you're not able to figure out how to move on how to how to reach the next stage where do i go from here and that's when panic kicks in and that's a very slippery slope because it's very difficult to recover right so Panic will also lead you to making careless mistakes. You will probably start overcomplicating things. So the best way to avoid panic is to practice with a timer. Now, we recommend 40 minute mocks. Okay, make set, set a timer. This, this you can do maybe um, not at the very start of your prep, but say a month or two into your prep. Start timing yourself a bit. See how long it takes for you to crack the DILR set. Maybe set a 40 minute timer. If you want to make things extra challenging, set a half an hour timer or set a 20 minute timer. Try solving a set, try solving two sets, right? When you reduce, when you, when you practice under increasingly unfair conditions, when you're practicing under brutal, deliberately brutal conditions, the actual exam, the actual mock is gonna appear a lot more manageable to you. Not the actual mock, sorry, the actual CAT exam is gonna appear a lot more manageable to you, okay? Underestimating and overestimating the logic, okay? Both of these are bad, don't do that. For instance, we often come across questions like, which of the following must be true? You solve, you look at each option and you try to figure out, hey, is this true? You find that it is true and then you stop there. And then you're like, ha, my, my work is done but it's not done. You see, because something could be true in a particular circumstance, in a particular case, but to check if it is always true, you have to start thinking of things the other way. Approach this problem from a different angle. Approach this problem backwards. Try disproving it. If you can disprove something, you're ruling out that option. Because now you know for sure it definitely can't, be, can't always be true. So maybe trying to, instead of trying to um, select or qualify something, maybe think of a workaround and try to disqualify it and see if you're, if you're able to disqualify it. If you can't disqualify it, no matter how hard you try, maybe, maybe that's always true. So food for thought, okay? The flip side, this was underestimating the, the logic. The flip side is overcomplicating the logic. CAT sets are complex, but they're not hyper complex, all right? They, they know that we have 40 minutes only to solve four sets or five sets. They're not, they're not expecting you to consider a lot of things that are external or that are not part of the case, case study. But people, they sometimes overcomplicate things, they, they overthink, and they end up imposing constraints which were not even there in the first place. You impose an extra set of constraints on what you're doing. You're not going to reach the answer. You'll be stuck in no man's land. Time runs out and then you end up not clearing the DILR cutoff, right? So imposing appropriate restrictions, appropriate constraints is fine. Going overboard with your constraints, overthinking constraints, over constraining yourself is not acceptable, okay? So the fix is stick to what's given, write down the exact conditions. This is to fix your over over complication to fix your under underestimation like i said go the other way around right for example if it's a question which says which of the following must be true try to disprove things rather than trying to prove them if you can disprove a few options you know for sure you know for sure they can't be right okay so these are some of the very um, common frequently seen frequently repeated errors that we that we have seen in our students and that frankly everybody goes through them everybody kind of ends up doing these once in a while so we thought well you know what we should discuss these we should maybe discuss some fixes so i hope this video video gave you some kind of value and um, if it did please like it please share it with your friends and please subscribe to our channel for uh, more interesting and valuable videos like these all right thank you so much have a nice day